I think it's appropriate that we are uh, hosting one of UCLA's most celebrated athletes in a week when one of our teams is preparing for the biggest game of the season. But of course, for our guest today, UCLA was only the beginning. After graduating in 1966, he went on to become one of the greatest to ever play his sport. His conduct on and off the court earned him the respect of his opponents and the admiration of the public. His activities today include writing, sportscasting, and serving as campaign chairman for the American Heart Association. Would you please welcome Arthur Ashe. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be back here at UCLA again, not after 20 years, but uh, I spent a lot of time, a lot of hours in this, in this building. Uh, most of it not very wisely. Downstairs in the coop, wasting away the, the lunchtime hours, like I'm sure you do also. Um, even though I'm here on, a, on my book tour, UC, my experience here at UCLA from 61 to 66 was so important that it merited uh, almost two chapters in my book. Um, I came here as a young black southern kid, uh, 18 years old, 3,000 miles away from home, and uh, there was the then tennis coach and later athletic director J.D. Morgan who thought I'd make a pretty good tennis player. And I don't think he fully expected uh, what would transgress thereafter. Uh, not even for him, because I don't think even J.D. in 1961 really thought he may wind up being athletic director one day. Uh, but he did assume that position in 65, my senior year, which was the last uh, year he was, da he was uh, Davis Cup coach. He was tennis coach here. And we managed to win the NCAA title right here at UCLA. Um, why was it important to me? And why was it very difficult? I guess it goes uh, to the heart of an answer I gave a student out on Bruin Walk there who was talking about the upcoming basketball game between the Black Student Association uh, here at UCLA and the Black Student Union at USC. And um, he was saying how how active the students were, black students were, minority students were on campus now. And he asked me if that were the case 20 years ago. I said, I said, how old are you? He said, 21. I said, well, when I entered UCLA, you were one year old. Um, and none of the civil rights laws had been passed yet. The Voting Rights Act hadn't been passed. None of those uh, civil rights legislation uh, edicts that were passed in the Johnson era, 63, 64, 65, none of that was passed when I entered UCLA. Uh, two things really rattled me within one month of me coming to UCLA. One was less than a week after I got here, there was a huge Bel Air fire which came over the uh, hills over here, and uh, it was so bad, in fact, it was one of the worst fires that this area has ever had, and uh, I even had soot in my uh, dorm room for weeks almost, just couldn't get it out. I lived at Sproul Hall for two years. Uh, and the second thing was my uh, denial uh, of, uh, of being able to play in a tournament south of here at a club which didn't admit blacks. And traditionally that club had hosted a tournament and had traditionally invited the members of the, at least the top members of the various college tennis teams around the Southland. And uh, I was the first uh, black varsity tennis team member on any one of the major college campuses like a U USC or a UCLA or a Pepperdine. Um, and so when I wasn't allowed to play at this club, J.D. called me into his office. His office was then over at the administration building, and he said, and I've only been here for two weeks now. And he said, uh, 
what do you want to do about it? And I said, uh, I'm not sure. I'm still a little shocked. And the reason I was shocked was because being a, a Southerner, I was rather used to discrimination. It was a way of life. Uh, I lived all of my formative years in Richmond, Virginia, where segregation was the law. I went to all black schools, all black churches. I had to ride in all black taxi cabs. I had to ride behind the white line on a bus that took you wherever you wanted to go. And in those days, um, California was thought of by blacks, especially southern blacks, as being the land of milk and honey, so to speak. You know, California was a land of opportunity. If you came out here, there was no prejudice. At least that's what we were told. And so everybody wanted to come out here. Uh, and that, that went also if you were Jewish. Because in the South, uh, people who were Jewish were, were discriminated almost as much. So when this club wouldn't let me play or said, no, he can't participate, that really sort of set me back on my heels. I said, well... I guess California is the same as Virginia, which it really isn't, or it wasn't then, isn't now, but um, it sort of gave a bit more balance to uh, my preconceived notions of, about what not only uh, California was like, but what the rest of the world was like. Um, so anyway, I, I think I did quite well here. I took very light loads in the spring because UCLA was then, as now, a tennis powerhouse, and I didn't want to have to worry about trying to uh, cram too much study into what is, for us, say, teams at USC or UCLA are very hectic tennis schedules in the spring. We took our tennis very seriously, but along with the wrestling team, the tennis team members had a very high scholastic average, and almost everyone graduated, and we were all quite proud of that. Of course, you had somebody like uh, J.D. Morgan behind you, and uh, he was the kind of guy, even when he was an associate business manager of the school, who knew how you were doing before you knew how you were doing, because he knew all the professors, and uh, even though he couldn't pull any strings as far as grades were concerned, he he certainly kept tabs on, on, the, on his team members. And obviously it's not quite as easy to do, although a greater effort is made to do it now at all the schools, but especially like at UCLA, with the other teams, the football teams, which, you know, you would have to keep tabs on maybe 45, 50 guys. It's not very easy. Um, I also thought that my time here sort of rounded out for me, uh, a pretty good notion of what uh, our country is all about. Um, not only is uh, Virginia a, a very southern state, but it's also a very eastern state. And the east is a bit priggish and a bit uh, stuffy about uh, its, its history. Um, and they fill up the history books that we read uh, in elementary school and junior high school and high school with the exploits of how Virginia was the mother of presidents, eight presidents born there, and uh, how we were the first this and the first that. And at this time, California was just a string of mis missions up and down the, the West Coast, or uh, a, lot of, a lot of desert, a lot of hot air out here. And the Western states were among the last to join the Union. Um, but when you grow up in the East and go to school in the West, you're able to compare the two and sort of synthesize what you think uh, may be a pretty good idea of what the country's like. How many of you in here were uh, born in California? All right, how many of you here have spent quite a bit of time on the East Coast, say New York City? Well, that's, that's a pleasant surprise in the sense that I saw quite a few hands of uh, people who are, say, over 30, which makes sense, but I also saw quite a few hands of uh, students who, uh, at a much younger age, have, have traveled a great deal. And I think that's very important, very important. 
Um, I went through all sorts of uh, trying, uh, wonderful, frightening, exhilarating experiences here. Um, what did I do here first that was interesting and exciting? One was, uh, it took me a while to get used to the idea that uh, it w wasn't going to snow in December. Uh, and that may sound very elementary to you, but to me it was pretty major. I don't like snow and I don't like cold weather, so I loved it out here. Um, the history books, as I alluded to earlier, were much different out here, especially uh, the history books you had to read in lower division uh, classes. History 7A, 7B, when I was here, was History of the United States. I don't know if it still is. probably isn't. And um, it seemed rather impersonal to sit in a, the huge lecture hall over there in the humanities building and have Dr. Salutis spit his cigar juice all over everybody who was in the front two rows. But uh, the people all seem to have a great deal of time for you, uh, even though you seem like you were just a number in going to these classes two or three times a week and then meet, meeting with your teaching assistants later to decide or find out if you really know what the professor was talking about. Um, this is 1961, and for most of you, you were, if you're a student here now, undergraduate, you were, what, no more than three or four years old. I was the second class to, um, to live in a co-ed dorm, which was a big thing here at UCLA in 61. Sproul Hall, I think, opened up in 19, September of 60, and uh, I came in, in September of 61, and uh, quite a few people didn't like it. I'm talking about parents now. Um, and the idea of possibly spending a lot of time in a co-ed dorm seemed idyllic at first. You know, oh wow, you know, girls are just over there in the tea part of the, uh, in the top of the tea, the tea part shaped building at that is Sproul Hall. And you know, if you liked somebody, you could see them a lot, which uh, could be a problem, actually more than uh, something that you found desirable. Uh, but that was a, a new experience all over. And surely enough, California would try it before they would try it, at, you know, back east at Harvard or surely in the Midwest where they would be the last to uh, finally give in. Again, being a, a black southern kid, I uh, dated a white girl here at UCLA for the first time. That was very frightening for me then. Uh, it was very scary. You know, in Virginia, you, would, you could get killed for that, uh, literally killed. And... Um, if anybody in here, you know, would, uh, who was my age or older and you're black and you, you, could, you could remember cases that you read in the paper or Jet magazine in the deep south of uh, men literally being killed or just disappearing for what they termed reckless eyeballing. If you looked at a white woman the wrong way, you know, they would take care of you. Uh, that was a very strange experience. Although you find out later that... Uh, it was really no, really no big deal out here. I mean, it was done quite often, and it, but it was just very strange for me to see it first time. Um, and then there was just the bigness of the place. Uh, I had been used to uh, small black colleges or smaller colleges back east. Enrollments no more than, oh, Virginia Union or Howard, the black schools like that. Enrollment in those days no more than a couple thousand. And it seems like there were a couple thousand in my history class every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And um, California also was the first state to really uh, come up with a statewide system of what's called junior colleges. I'd never even heard of a junior college when I got here. Uh, they're now called com community colleges, the rest of the country. And then there were the strange foods. I'd never even heard of a taco before I got to California. Uh, they, they, they just, in Virginia, they didn't have tacos. Uh, they didn't have Mexican restaurants. And um, least of all, restaurants of that sort wouldn't have interested me too much in Virginia because before I got here, even if there had been Mexican restaurants, I couldn't go because restaurants were segregated. 
Um, so, you know, the four years I spent here at Tennis Aside was a very uh, interesting time. And I often think of what my life would have been like uh, had I not come to UCLA because I had been offered tennis scholarships to quite a few other schools. But uh, when Mr. Morgan did call me that one day and asked me if I wanted to come to UCLA, it's, it's a bit like asking somebody if he wants to go to heaven. Um, you may not think it's funny, but to me, <laughs> but back then, if you wanted to play tennis, um, and back then also there was no pro tennis in those days, no such thing. I was going to come to UCLA, you know, graduate. Uh, I took ROTC for four years because when I was here, it was mandatory. You had to take it for two years, every male. And uh, even the decision to take the last two years of ROTC was something that uh, uh, J.D. helped me to make. He, with the uh, help of another gentleman here who is now a federal judge, Judge Robert Kelleher, who was then Davis Cup captain, uh, it was a big decision for me, and uh, there being no pro tennis in those days, uh, he said, uh, J.D. said, Arthur, you know, uh, to have been a military officer would look very good on your resume one day. And um, when I thought about it, it made sense, uh, because in those days I was certainly 1A, and there was no way I was going to escape going into the Army. It was very difficult in those days to get uh, deferments for any reason. You really had to pull some strings, and my selective service board was not in California, it was in Virginia. And there was no way anybody out here was going to be able to pull sufficient strings to get me out of going into the Army. And I didn't really want to duck it. Um, not because uh, I was so strong against the Vietnam War, which was just starting to be uh, talked about on campus, but because my family had a very strong military history. Uh, my uh, lots of aunts and uncles and cousins went into the armed services and it was just expected that that's what you do if, if called upon. Of course, it's a lot different now. People try everything they can to get out of going. Since Reagan just the other day reaffirmed the volunteer system, uh, none of you have to worry about it. So that gives you a pretty good idea of what life for me was like when I was here 20 years ago. And it was exactly 20 years ago, um, the semester that I started right here. And um, I wouldn't change it for anything. I think it has made a great deal of difference. And I don't think I would have been as good a tennis, not nearly as good a tennis player as I'd been if I had not come to a school like a UCLA or USC who were the two tennis powers, but I, I chose uh, UCLA because it was, uh, it had a great program and obviously it was academically very uh, well respected and also because USC never offered me a scholarship. Uh, but in hindsight I uh, was glad I chose to come here. And also when I was here uh, there weren't very many black students here. Uh, and the black students that were here were uh, quite gifted. I mean, they were like straight-A students, almost valedictorians, especially if they were girls. A lot of the guys here at UCLA were athletes. Uh, and I asked the, just a few minutes ago about the minority black student enrollment here in the undergraduate division. Someone told me, I don't know if it's accurate, that it's about 1,200 now. Well, when I was here, it wasn't not even close to 1,200. It should be higher. And I've uh, sent several notes to Chancellor Young saying it should be higher. But uh, and, and it will continue to go up. But uh, when I was here, I'd say no more than two or 300. And uh, we all knew one another by our first names by the end of the first semester here. Uh, and most of those who were here, most of the black students were, who were here, lived right here in Los Angeles, and they commuted every day, which is a very tough commute, because most of them live in Compton. So um, that pretty much describes uh, my life at UCLA. Um, the book, incidentally, I'm not a very hard sell author. 
Um, but the book doesn't deal too much with my tennis exploits because I figure if you really want to know about that, you can pick up some tennis magazine or book and find that out easily enough. But there were some things which uh, I think had a tremendous influence on how I came to be what I am. And uh, UCLA and J.D. Morgan were certainly monumental influences. Anybody have any questions? Yes. Glad to see you, Arthur. Thank you. You know who I am? Uh, well, I just asked. Face looks familiar. Okay. Nice T-shirt you got there. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I have three questions I uh, would like to propose, and I'll put them, and you can just go elaborate. Uh, would you explain, as a matter of education, to the audience how long blacks been playing tennis? And number two, what's the future of the ATA? And number three. Uh, do you think that the responsibility are more or less put on the parents as to training the youth, whereas we had many tennis clinics come along uh, sponsored by the USLTA? Yeah. Uh, the first question, uh, dealing with the length of time blacks have been playing, they've been playing a long time, but like with everything else, they were excluded from the, uh, the major tournaments. Uh, Immediately after World War II, around 1950, um, at the, the Forest Hills Tournament, the most important tournament uh, in the U.S., now the U.S. Open at Flushing Meadows, same event, the USTA agreed to take the, the, the finalists from the all-black American Tennis Association event into the tournament directly every year. But otherwise, you didn't get to play them. Um, and that American Tennis Association, which is sort of the black counterpart to the U.S. Tennis Association, the one which people who play tennis would be familiar with, that's been around for more than 60 years. And if it hadn't been for them, when I was a kid, I wouldn't have been able even to get to the stage where a J.D. Morgan would offer me a scholarship because it was basically a Southern-oriented uh, group, and um, they provided a very competitive outlet for promising young black players. Uh, and I guess the reason none of them uh, ever got as far as I did was because uh, uh, you need to go through about two or three stages if you're really going to be uh, get all the way up to the top. There are a lot of tennis coaches, teachers, especially here in Los Angeles and Southern California, who on a playground, a public park, can very adequately teach you the basics, uh, show you the correct grip, show you the correct swing, and you can become a fairly proficient uh, player. But then uh, that person may not be able to take you to the next level. What, what, it's what I call uh, uh, college-level tennis on the order of, say, a UCLA or, uh, you know, the Pac-10 tennis. That requires a, a more advanced knowledge of uh, training techniques, how to deal with competitive situations, what to do as far as strategy is concerned. And then there's that third level. There are quite a few college coaches who can't take you... Uh, as far as, as winning Wimbledon, even even if the talent's there. Obviously, uh, of course, a uh, Glenn Bassett here can do it. I mean, he's one of those few co coaches who can, and and uh, but there are not that many Glenn Bassett. Some Dick Gould up at Stanford can do it. Um, there are a few others, but not too many college coaches can do it. Um, and recruiting isn't all there is to it. Uh, there are quite a few very promising players by say promising, I mean players, <clears throat> players who were ranked number one in the juniors in the United States who failed to make it to number one in the men's ranks. Somewhere along the line, they lost something. Either that or they got lucky in the juniors. Yes. Aha. Uh -huh. Yes, quite a few positive things happened to me in Virginia. All, um, all I think, basically within the, the black community and all fostered by you know, that rather close-knit uh, association of, of, of black people there. Uh, you, you, tended to band it, you tended to band closer together, you know, in the South in those days because you were, the odds were stacked so high against you. But I had uh, very good teachers in, in the public schools that I did go to, um, 
you knew that if you really had something on the ball, so to speak, when you graduated from high school in Richmond, Virginia, or any place in the South, you had to leave the South. Because the highest thing that you could aspire to in 61 when I graduated, you could be a college professor, maybe hope to be college president one day, but nothing else. I mean, you're not going to be the manager of any company. You're not going to, you weren't even on the city council, you know, no representation in the state legislature, nothing like that. Uh, so if you were ambitious and uh, you had proved yourself in the public school systems, you, you left. And uh, my whole class left. Anybody who uh, really had any ambition, we all left Virginia. And generations and generations and generations of black people in my place all left the South and either came out here or, uh, or they went north. And now it's the other way. Now they're starting to go back home. Yes. Um, was your rise to the top of the tennis world, was it carefully planned or did you take it from the country? Was my rise to the top of the tennis world carefully planned or did I take it? Uh, it was planned in the sense that uh, major moves were thought, ab thought about with a lot of deliberation. Uh, the tournaments that were selected for me when I was in the juniors were given a lot of thought. Uh, I went to St. Louis, Missouri to finish my senior year in high school. That was given a lot of thought because uh, at 17 years of age I was one of the best my age in the country, but uh, it was thought that if I didn't get to play all year round, the following year I'd be left behind. And R Richmond, Virginia offered no indoor facilities, and if they had, I wouldn't have been able to use them anyway. So I went to St. Louis, and then uh, I was here at UCLA for four and a half years. Then I went to the Army for two years. Uh, I was stationed at West Point. And then uh, professional tennis, as you know it and read it in the papers, started in 1969. You see, there was no pro tennis when I was at UCLA. Uh, there were those one-night stands that the likes of, say, uh, Pancho Gonzalez and his group would do. They'd go around, all around the world with these uh, one night stands and at most they'd make maybe oh if, if they made a hundred thousand a year they were doing very well very well and now you know a Borg or a McEnroe can make a hundred thousand dollars in a couple of days literally a couple of days um, so uh, pro tennis didn't really start till 69 so I didn't have designs to be a professional tennis player when I was at UCLA didn't, it didn't really enter my mind I was gonna I was gonna go around the world as an amateur for a couple of times just so I could see those places that I read about in National Geographic magazine and then go back to either law school or, or business school. Yes? You were on the Larry King show for three hours. Yes. Uh, you talked about many things. The one thing you did not talk about, the thing I think you should get interested in, is why do so many black people have such early um, his question was why is that so many black people have early heart disease? Earliest. Earliest. Um, oh sure. Um, well, for, for one thing, uh, heart disease can be passed down. It, you know, it, it's it's hereditary. And secondly, uh, there are sh still great numbers of us who are ill-informed and uninformed about the, the dangers of heart disease. Um, high blood pressure, hypertension, same, same thing, runs rampant in the black community. Uh, part of it's diet. Part of it is that uh, we sometimes don't always take our medicine when we should. In fact, now, since I'm national campaign chairman of the American Heart Association, you may notice that uh, ads that we would put on, uh, say, KJLH or uh, the, the black stations in, in the U.S. are not the same as some of the ads we put on KABC. The ads that we put on the black stations now have to do with take your medicine, not which medicine to take or these are the risk factors. We found that in lots of black communities, You'll be given the medicine, and the medicine will be paid for by someone, Medicaid or Medicare or whatever, but you don't take it after you get it. 
And uh, as a consequence, we still suffer greatly. Can I ask that question? Yep. Is it true that black people have the aversion to milk with their milk and drink water or ice water with their milk? Could that have some bearing on the fact that black people... Is it true that black people have an aversion to milk with their meals and drink water or what else? Or ice? Or ice? Ice liquids. Uh, no, I think we all uh, still believe basically that uh, milk's good when you're a kid. If you're a southerner, there's no question that iced tea is part of your meal. You know, everybody drinks iced tea in the south. I mean, that's almost like a, a, a regional drink. Uh, but no, I don't think we have any national ethnic uh, propensity to drink ice drinks, no. Arthur. Arthur. Kool-Aid, maybe. Excuse <laughs> <laughs> me. No, not really. Arthur. Oh, All sorry. Right. Question over yes. here, yes. Uh, I'd like to welcome you. Uh, my name is Michael Spears. And Michael? I'm from Brook Brookfield Garden. Oh, you're from Richmond, Virginia. And you've eaten at my house before when you were younger. Oh. <laughs> uh, so you know what I'm talking about. So I know what you're talking about. But the question, two little brief questions, I think one will be of major interest. First of all, your communication with your wife and letting her use her maiden name in today's society, I think that has some interest possibly. Don't have any choice. <laughs> <laughs> she, she, uh, and, but, uh, oh. go ahead, go ahead. Well, now I encourage my wife to use her maiden name. If she wanted to use her maiden name, that's fine with me. I had absolutely no objections. In fact, I encourage her to do that. And I am, uh, I'm a big propo proponent and backer of the ERA and women's lib and so forth. But, but I do so only because I saw what it did. Uh, I saw how the situation changed when the civil rights legislation was passed. The arguments were very similar. The arguments were. Well, the laws are already there, and we don't need any more laws. But funny enough, after these so-called new unnecessary laws were passed, things changed quite rapidly. And I think um, women who are discriminated against, especially economically, uh, on the principle of equal pay for equal work, if the laws are more specifically defined, then they'll have a, a bit more to hang their head on, so to speak, when they uh, file their grievances. Mm -hmm. The second question, in light of the fact that I'm from Durham, North Carolina now myself, uh, I find that many individuals and many students from California are kind of one-sided in reference to prejudice, I'd say. And the other thing is that with tennis in general, since I've been playing tennis myself about 26, 28 years, that it was really known as a sissies game back then among blacks. Yes. Could you kind of touch on that? Yes, it, it was. Uh, tennis wasn't, didn't have a very high social utility in school. If you were captain of the tennis team, you weren't going to get to go out with the prettiest girl necessarily. No. Uh, in fact, uh, the rest of the athletes would sort of look the other way, which was the case for a while, but uh, all of a sudden, and even in the Richmond papers, when I started getting more ink than anybody else, then they started changing their minds. And also, when a few of the... Uh, athletes in the other sports started trying tennis, they also found out that it wasn't as easy as they thought. Uh, tennis is a very difficult game. Uh, it's, it's not easy. Uh, I think part of the reason is because it's not a team sport. There are no timeouts, there are no substitutions, and even in uh, college tennis, uh, I think coaching is only allowed after each set. I think, I think that's true. Is that the way it goes, Marcel? Yeah, only after each set is there, is there, are you allowed any coaching. And in the pro ranks, obviously not at all. I had to beg people to play when I was younger. Uh, at first, only because who wants to play tennis with a you know, seven or eight-year-old kid dragging his racket around. <laughs> but uh, later on, it, it changed rather quickly. Yeah. But you get time for a couple more questions. Yes. The 
question was, um, she read my first book and she thought that I encountered so much prejudice that I may have thought of stopping uh, midway through my tennis career. The answer is uh, no, <clears throat> and, and the reason is that the story I tell about my formative years is just as true of any other black person who lived in Richmond, Virginia, including my friend over here. I don't know, Mr. Mears, is it? Spears. Oh, Spears. Yeah, I know that last name. Yeah. Yeah, now I do remember. Uh, no, he went through the same thing. And since we all went through it, you sort of, uh, you commiserate together. Uh, but no, I never thought of stopping, basically because it, it, it was better than the alternative. Um, and also because I was doing quite well. I mean, I was successful. And on the tour itself, I never encountered any racism. Ever. I mean, no other player, even in the juniors or in the senior ranks, ever tried to cheat me that, that I know of, never called me a bad name. That, that never happened to me. So I always uh, felt terrific about the players. Uh, the people in the stands, that's a different story. Ms. Ash. Yes. Oh, sorry. Since there are so few numbers of um, black students on this campus when you're here, how important was fraternity ties or sorority ties at that time? How important uh, were fraternity and sorority ties? Mm -hmm. Well, that's something I could have talked about more in, in my book, although I didn't know that much about it. That was very touchy then. Uh, first of all, no black fraternity had a house on campus. I mean, I... I, uh, I do they now? Oh. Okay. <laughs> You're going to tell me something I didn't know. Um, there were a couple of fraternities you could join, but first of all, I couldn't afford to join a fraternity house, but it was a very dodgy situation. The two Jewish fraternities would let you join if they liked you, but, but uh, the rest, you just knew, you know, no, and some of them had very southern origins, you know, they even had, you know, rebel flags hanging outside the windows, so you would... You know, I wouldn't go near anything with the, with, with the stars and bars hanging out of the second floor window. Uh, but again, that was the way it was, and they weren't bad. They didn't hang up any, there weren't any swastikas hung up, and they weren't, nobody, you know, wrote the word nigger on your door or anything like that. But we also then had our own, well, the Kappas did, and I'm a, a Kappa, we, the house on Crenshaw Boulevard, and we would, and that house also served more than one campus. But n no, uh, the, the, the Greek movement on campus was not very strong unless you were from the South, and the, uh, it, unless you were born in the South. But if you were born in, say, Los Angeles or in the North, the, uh, the Greek fraternity movement wasn't that appealing to you because it wasn't that big in the North. Yes. He asked, do I see myself getting into politics in the future? I once thought about doing it. I've had several people even now ask me about it and want me to get, get, into, get into it in a big way, but uh, I really have become a bit disillusioned with it. Uh, I also don't think that uh, becoming an, elective, uh, an elected official is nearly as important or as influential as it used to be. Senators and congressmen used to be more powerful than they are now. Um, but unless you're a committee chairman, which means you have a lot of seniority, which the southern senators did, which is the way they balanced the overwhelming, they say, uh, preference in the northern liberal press for seeing things the other way, they bottled things up in committees because they were the committee chairman. But unless you wanted to make that your life, then... Uh, it may not be that appealing to you. I basically now feel that uh, you can possibly do more good as a private citizen and, and, not being, and still being involved in politics, but not in an elective way. I mean, I think a guy like, uh, I think one of the most militant guys I've ever met in my life is Ralph Nader. And, he's, and he wears, you know, 
He's about the most nondescript looking guy you've ever seen. He never thrown a rock, you know, never set fire to anything. But when Ralph Nader talks, it hits the front page of the New York Times because it's been researched as thoroughly as you can, res as one can do it, and um, and it gets results. One more question. Mr. Ash. Where is she? Oh, yes. sorry. Yes. Um, how do you deal with the pressure of the stress and competition on the court as well as in your personal social life? How did I deal with the pressures? I guess I dealt with it okay until I had my heart attack and then it all came out. <laughs> uh, uh, there, is, there is pressure in uh, being the first in anything. Um, uh, here at UCLA, it wasn't very difficult. It wasn't difficult at all compared to, you know, life outside. But lots of things are expected of you. I think, in hindsight, the one thing that bothers me, in absolute terms, is that I'm convinced I could have been a better tennis player if I had not had those pressures. And th those pressures were not so much pressures of being black, but the pressures of being black in the early 60s. If I were coming through UCLA right now, I wouldn't have the same pressures. I wouldn't open up the LA Times and see that students from North Carolina A&T and, and, and Morgan State and Howard you know, are being attacked by dogs and they have hoses on them and they're being beat over the head for sitting in a, in a restaurant. That's what I used to see in the LA Times when I was at UCLA. And if you were black and from the South and had any feeling at all, you felt I should be sitting there with them. And uh, as such, you know, L.A. got pretty radicalized and it all came out in the riots in the later 60s, but now uh, there's no great cause, I think, that black students uh, can latch on to with any fervor right now, so the pressures are a bit less. Uh, I don't... I don't feel sorry that I didn't uh, do better you know, on the tennis court because I had these pressures. I think I responded you know, the right way. But uh, when I look at it strictly from a tennis point of view, I think I could have been a, a bit better player if I had been able to be as single-minded about my tennis as, say, Bjorn Borg or John McEnroe, who do nothing but eat, live, sleep tennis. Uh, I didn't have that luxury. And um, uh, I would have a bit more of that luxury these days. Um, I want to thank you for your attention today. Uh, certainly enjoyed being back. Thank you.